A Lagos Judicial Panel turns down Lekki Concession Company's request to take back possession of the toll gate for evaluation of damages. Federal government denies generating no ply lists as International Criminal Court opens inquiry into hashtag NSAS protest. In international news, President Donald Trump and challenger Joe Biden locked in tight contest for U.S. presidency. And in sport, Oyo Swan Chairman Nii Alibiyoshi appointed into NFF Media Committee. This is ANN News. I am Olaju Mokil Latunji. Niger has tested more than 630,000 the country's 200 million people since the country recorded its first COVID-19 case in February. This was disclosed by the Nigeria Center for Disease Control as it reported 137 cases in 16 states on Tuesday. Nigeria also confirmed four new deaths from the virus, which brings to 1,151, the total number of COVID-19 fatalities across the country. Of the new Tuesday figure, Lagos chopped 60, Abia was behind with 21 cases, FCT 18. Certain other states, including Rivers, also contributed to the new figure. Lagos remains the hot spot for the virus with more than 21,000 infections. So far, 59,634 persons have recovered and have been discharged. There are still about 3,000 active cases in the country. Lagos state government has raised an alarm over a resurgence of the COVID-19 pandemic in the state. Commissioner for Health, Professor Aki Abayomi, says this is because of the Gaussian's continuous flagrant disregard of state safety guidelines. Abayomi says it is important that people stay away from unnecessary movements and social gatherings, stressing that traveling in and out of a country should be discouraged except when absolutely necessary. He said many of the affected countries had found it necessary to impose a second lockdown and restriction of movements. The commissioner says based on data available, it is wrong to believe that COVID-19 has been conquered. He says it is alarming that many residents have abandoned the use of face masks and other safety measures and protocols put in place by the government. Meanwhile, Director General of the Nigeria Center for Disease Control, Dr. Chikwe Ehekwazu, says all National Youth Service Call members will be given the new antigen-based test. Ehekwazu says this is necessary for safe reopening of the NYSE orientation camps across the country. The center disclosed that the process of procurement of the antigen-based test was almost complete. Iyekwaza also reviewed that the government had launched infection prevention and control called Vanguard in all the states. He also said young persons interested in IPC are currently in training for self-management and self-regulation in the camps as they opened. The State Judicial Panel of Inquiry and Restitution has turned down a request by the Lekki Concession Company to take possession of the toll gates to evaluate damages. During Tuesday's sitting, LCC Counsel Otimi Seriki asked the panel to allow the firm to take possession to evaluate the level of damage ahead of making insurance claims and starting the process of carrying out necessary repairs. Panel Chairperson Doris Okuobo denied the request and asked Seriki to encourage his clients to make the request after the panel had finished with the footage submitted earlier in the day. LCC suspended activities at the Toll Plaza last month after soldiers were allegedly caught on live videos shooting at hashtag and SARS protesters who blocked the toll gate for 13 days. LCC MD Abayomi Omomua told the panel of inquiry lights went off at the target just before the shooting incident because its staff left at 4.30 p.m. Among were also confirmed that the staff in charge of the generators also left because they didn't want to provoke any protesters. 
The federal government has denied generating a no-fly list of persons who participated in the hashtag NSAS protest across the country. In a series of tweets by the Ministry of Interior, the federal government emphasized, quote, it did not, had not, and would not generate such lists. Earlier in the week, there were reports that the Nigeria Immigration Service prevented a promoter of the hashtag NSOS movement, Udupe Odele, from traveling abroad on Monday. Odele tweeted that the officers detained her, seized her passport, and caused her to miss her flight. A scenario generated intense discussion among Nigerians, with many urging the government to stop harassing Odele. One of the protesters, uh, one of the promoters of the hashtag NSOS movement, Fekemi Abudu, confirmed in a tweet on Tuesday that bank accounts of several persons involved in the protest had been frozen. Meanwhile, the International Criminal Court has confirmed that it is conducting examinations of the recent hashtag NSOS protest in Nigeria. The office of the ICC prosecutor said in a statement it had received information on alleged humanity, uh, crimes against humanity. The ICC said it would make findings of the preliminary examination public. Four civil society groups have advised the federal government to begin dredging the River Niger and also step up measures to mitigate flood menace. They say this will save more than 20,000 families who have been sacked by floods in a number of states. The groups say only the dredging of the River Niger will stop the perennial flooding that has displaced thousands of river line communities in Ogbaru and Ayamulim local government areas in a number of north sanitary zone. They also called for a change of academic calendar for schools in communities affected by flooding and deployment of medical doctors and primary health care givers to provide health care services to victims of flooding in IDP camps across the state. Coming up, African stories. South African Airways avoids bankruptcy with government funding. And later, international news. President Donald Trump and challenger Joe Biden locked in tight contest for U.S. presidency. You are watching ANN. Somewhere in the world, every second of the day, news is happening. And of course, Nigeria is bustling with news day and night. That is why ANN doesn't sleep. Our eyes are peeled, wide open, so no story escapes our radar. We stay abreast of world events and happenings at home. We keep you up to the minutes in the world of sports. We give you information to stay on top of your investment and all the hard facts you need to navigate your day. If you miss us on air, you can keep up to date on our website and on our social media platforms, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at ANN Africa TV. We are ANN Africa News Network. We do news right in a truly African spirit. Welcome back, this is ANN News. South Africa's flag carrier, the South African Airways, has been dogged by financial chaos for quite some time. The airline had broached bankruptcy many times, but help always came to save the company. Again, now, the carrier has avoided liquidation with new government funding. Correspondent Subitra Undu has the story. For years, SAA has been mismanaged and plagued by political interference. This is why many were not surprised when the finance minister announced another loan to save the airline. The $656 million will be used for severance packages and to service some of the airline's debt. This restructured airline will only have approximately 1,300 employees. 3,200 workers at SAA will either have to take voluntary severance packages or be retrenched. So an extremely high price has been paid for this. And to make matters worse, for the last five months or more, 
our members have not been earning any salary. Praveen Gordon, the Minister of Public Enterprises, has expressed confidence that a new airline under a potential strategic private partnership will emerge by June next year. Privatisation has never been on the cards for the government or for the unions. But it does seem like it is the only alternative now to ensure that SAA keeps flying. This for us, it's not the ideal situation given that the alternative would have been an airline which has either been wind down or liquidated and there all workers would lose everything in that type of scenario. Aviation expert Desmond Latham says it won't be easy to convince private equity into a deal given the legacy of political interference in SAA. When they went into business rescue in December, SAA had 48 aeroplanes. They now have seven. There's a lot of blurred and grey areas here. I mean, the recovery period initially will be paying debt, paying retrenchments, uh, that money that's been earmarked, and there will be some um, uh, of the cash made available to try and resurrect the airline by probably mid of 2021. Latham also warns against the timing and the turbulence this industry is going through. COVID is having a major impact on global aviation. In Africa, it's down 90% in some places, and the overall expectation is only 30% recovery um, by early in the new year. Ethiopian Airlines is government-owned, for example, and makes a profit because it's not government-managed. And there's a big difference here in South Africa. The management team at SAA were politically instituted, if you like. The board of directors was massively um, interfered with by the ruling party, and the result is that it collapsed. Adam Voss, the CEO for SAA Technical, resigned at the weekend, not ideal as the airline attempts to get back in the air. While some are hopeful, many experts believe SAA should be left on the ground. Zimbabwe is experiencing serious water shortage. Water taps have dried up as a result of inadequate infrastructure and treatment chemicals. This has forced Zimbabweans to find alternatives, and some of which are quite unpleasant. Respondents of a fire Wakutuya reports. Another delivery and outflow of 35 US dollars. That's how much Lawrence Masamba has to fork out each time he orders water from one of several delivery companies that have sprung up to quench demand spurred by Harare's water crisis. Our boy is only 40 meters deep. Uh, only a few weeks ago, it ran dry. So now we are forced to buy water every... Uh, we buy Wednesday to Wednesday. That's approximately a week. So, and we buy 5,000 liters in every seven days. So that is a big challenge to us. Things are harder in less affluent suburbs where the search for the scarce liquid is a daily struggle that can take up several hours. Pressure has forced some to risk their health. There's a foul stench coming from this water which betrays the harmful contents that it's carrying. Despite that, it is a channel that many here rely on to do their household laundry and for some to take a bath. Sometimes we find raw sewage flowing, but there's nothing we can do. I can't afford the water, which is sold for one US dollar per bucket. I barely have enough money for food, let alone for water to do laundry. Unsafe sources can expose people to waterborne diseases. But after years of exposure from these sources, some residents say they've grown used to it. We know there are diseases, but at the same time, we can't keep dirty laundry in the home. We have been doing this for so long now, and we have never fallen sick. Not everyone is as lucky. Four typhoid cases were recently reported. The four cases that were reported on were noticed in early October and the people have since been uh, treated and they are now safe. But fears of future outbreak remain, especially since there appears to be no short-term solution to the long-running crisis. Progress. On paper, yes, we're talking, to, we're talking about construction of dams, but no big project has started now. Equipment to increase pumping capacity has been procured but won't improve supply everywhere. 
meaning some could be stuck in this dire situation for some time to come. The International Criminal Court, ICC, says it will conduct a preliminary examination into the recent hashtag and source protest in Nigeria. The Office of the ICC prosecutor said in a statement it had received information on alleged crimes and confirmed to the BBC that it is opening an inquiry. ICC says it will assess whether the legal criteria for opening an investigation under the Roman Statute are met. Protesters, most of the youths, demonstrated two weeks ago in streets and major towns across the country against police brutality. In late October, the Nigerian army cracked down on the protesters at a major toll plaza and allegedly opened fire on the civilians, killing at least 51. 11 police officers and seven soldiers also lost their lives. Rights groups Amnesty International confirmed the incident, but both the army and police have rejected Amnesty's allegation. When we return, international news. President Donald Trump and challenger Joe Biden locked in tight contest for U.S. presidency. And later, sports. Oyo Swine Chairman Ni Alebioshu appointed into NFF Media Committee. You are watching ANN. Welcome back. This is ANN News. No hiccups were recorded at any polling station in the United States on Tuesday, despite substantial pre-election anxiety. An unprecedented number of Americans went to the polls to elect a new president in a process many described as smooth. Law enforcement officials and voter advocates had reported few voter intimidation incidents, but no major breakdown of law and order. The results of the bitterly fought election campaign between President Donald Trump and challenger former Vice President Joe Biden is still up in the air, too tight to declare a winner at this point. By early Wednesday morning, rural candidates had secured the 270 electoral college votes needed to win. The results may now not come for days. Trump won in Florida, a major battleground state Biden had thought he would flip for the Democrats. Some battlegrounds, including Florida, were also called, leaving the three northern industrial states, Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania, as the potential states that would determine who wins the White House. Although Trump had promised not to declare premature victory, he did just that, claiming victories in several key states where vote counting was still in progress. He also said he would take the election to the Supreme Court. His challenger, Joe Biden, had called for patience for all the votes to be counted before a winner is declared. Biden leads an electoral college vote count at 238 against Trump's 213. 270 electoral votes are required to win the White House. Austria has declared three days of national mourning for the four civilians that were killed and 17 others that were injured after gunmen opened fire at multiple locations in Vienna, the Austrian capital, on Monday evening. Correspondent Jensen Pleschkosberger reports. Vienna is mourning the victims of a brutal terrorist attack after gunmen opened fire at six locations in the city center on Monday evening. Around 17 injured people are still being treated in several Viennese hospitals. Some of them are in life-threatening conditions. According to the Chinese embassy in Austria, the deaths include one Austrian Chinese. Another injured Chinese is at a local hospital but not in critical condition. The investigation is still ongoing in what the government is calling an Islamist terrorist attack that struck the Austrian capital. The police shot dead one attacker after the shootings, a man wearing an explosive spelt that turned out to be fake. 
Witnesses have described crowds being fired on in bars with automatic rifles as many people took advantage of a last evening out before the start of a nationwide coronavirus curfew. In the past decades, Austria has never experienced such a serious attack. First coronavirus and now this. It's a horror. I'm scared. Me as a mother with three children, I'm afraid. It's not egal about Christus. It doesn't matter if you are a Christian, a Muslim, Catholic or Orthodox or any other religion. Man is simply man. It is no longer normal when someone kills people just like that. Following the terrorist attack in Vienna, the Austrian government declared a three-day national mourning. On Wednesday, schools will commemorate the victims at the start of classes. The nation is in shock. Belgium is facing a sharp rise in COVID-19 infections. Three weeks ago, the country recorded an average of nearly 8,000 new cases per day. 2,500 patients have been hospitalized, 400 of whom are in intensive care. The hospitals face the possibility of a shortage of bed space. Respondent Tony Waterman reports. I'm standing in one of the COVID-19 wards at CHU Liège. It's one of the main hospitals in the province. There are 20 rooms which are available here right now. 18 of them are occupied. These aren't the sickest patients. All of them are conscious. Some of them I've seen walking around the hallways here. If you go up two floors, you will find one of the hospital's five ICU wards. In that part of the hospital, people are very sick. Five people are on ventilators right now, and it is completely full. And this scenario is playing out across the country. As of Tuesday, all of the ICU beds in Brussels capital region were occupied. Health experts expect the number of patients in Belgium's ICU to continue to increase until about mid-November. Uh, the country only has about 2,000 beds and more than 1,300 of them are now occupied. But experts say if the lockdown rules are strictly followed, then the country could avoid running out. And there are some faint glimmers of hope that the COVID restrictions rolled out over the past couple of weeks, so the closure of all restaurants and bars, a curfew, a work from home order, that those measures are starting to work. The number of new infections while still climbing is doing so at a much slower pace, up 4% in the past week. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, it was doubling every week. But the two to three week delay between patients contracting the disease and landing in the hospital means that it could be another fortnight before hospitals see any sort of long-term relief. Many espresso coffee lovers around the world cherish the taste of the beverage. Of course, everyone knows espresso is an Italian invention. An Italian family began making espresso coffee in the 1800s. Now, it's the sixth world heritage status for it. Respondent Hermione Kitson reports. For the Sacuela family, espresso is a way of life. But after five generations, their recipe for success remains a closely guarded secret. Uh, there are a lot of secrets. If I tell all, there will not be any more secret. But first of all, obviously, there will be a blend, will be a roasting, will be also the, the correct use of all the machine and everything make a good espresso at the end. Espresso is the Italian coffee, an art created in 1884, now embedded in everyday culture. Espresso belongs to Italy. As well, Italy belongs to the espresso. It is uh, rich not only of a flavor of a, of a body, but it is also a flavor of a relationship. It is a flavor of a communication. This value beyond the cup is something Sacuela knows well. It's part of a national consortium wanting espresso to be recognized by UNESCO as an intangible world heritage product. They import from 20 different countries and say the perfect espresso is a complex science. Each single origin to single country gives a different taste of the coffee so you have to create a blend like a parfum so that you have a perfect well balanced coffee after the roasting phase the coffee is stored up to 28 days and in that time the natural oils are released to create the aroma flavor and body during lockdown it was one of the experiences italians craved the most one of the most uh, missing uh, moment was uh, really the, uh, the espresso and to share an espresso in a bar uh, together with uh, uh, friends. This month the group launched a website to collect signatures and personal experiences. 
Espresso coffee is not just of cultural importance. Economically, it also makes a significant contribution, generating around $4 billion for the local economy each year. Producers say UNESCO recognition would help protect against foreign products wrongly using the espresso brand. Also, this would be for us uh, as a producer, as a category, as an industry, very important for us to, to keep and maintain uh, this ownership on this kind of way of drink or coffee. The consortium will formally present its case to UNESCO in November. Up next, sport. Oyoswan chairman Nihi Alebioshu appointed into NFF Media Committee. Please stay with us. You are watching ANN. Whether in your house, at your office, on your phone or online, we are there. We have the facts behind the headlines. We cut to the chase with the news you really need. We cover every angle. We are the bigger, better news network. We are African News Network. ANN. Watch ANN News on MITV from a truly African spirit. Welcome back. This is ANN News. In sport, our state chairman of Sports Writers Association of Nigeria, Nia Libyoshu, has been appointed into the Media and Publicity Committee of the Nigeria Football Federation. The NFF Media and Publicity Committee is headed by the chairperson of the Nigeria Women Football League, Aisha Faladi. Olivia she has also served as media officer for the Youth Sports Federation of Nigeria and as media consultant to Nigeria School Sports Federation. Flying Eagles coach Lydon Boso is expected to announce on Wednesday his provisional squad list for the Waffle B Under-20 tournament scheduled for later this month. Nigeria's seven-time winners of the competition have been drawn in Group B of the tournament's zonal qualifiers alongside Ivory Coast and Ghana. Bozo was appointed coach of the Flying Eagles for a second time last month. In his first stint, he led Nigeria to the quarterfinals of the 2007 FIFA Under-20 World Cup in Canada. That is ANN News this evening. Thank you for joining us. For details on these and other breaking stories, visit our website, annafrica.news. Conversation continues on our social media platforms, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at ANN Africa TV. I am Olajumoke Olatunji. Have a pleasant evening.